Thank you, everyone. So this uh, session is about um, global best practice in demand-side management. Um, this could be the sort of great earthquake which is going to hit the water industry in this sector in that um, you know, demand management has been something which has uh, been quite ignored uh, in the region for many years. Um, I suspect the main reason for that is that uh, despite being one of the most water scarce places in the world, it's also one of the places which has charged its citizens less for water than anything else. So nobody's really seen much uh, financial benefit in, in that demand management. Um, but today we're going to find out that it's under attack from four different sides, and we've got four people here to uh, explain their different attacks. Um, first, we'll have uh, Asad uh, Sadeh, who's uh, from Nestle Waters uh, uh, Management and Technology. Nestle's been one of the leaders in the whole sort of corporate water stewardship movement. Uh, their chairman, Peter Brabeck, is sort of deeply committed to this, and he's uh, been behind all sorts of uh, initiatives such as the Chief Executive's Water Mandate, really getting into how um, uh, in, uh, corporate water users can reduce their water footprint. Um, uh, then we'll uh, hear from uh, Dr. Ibrahim Abdul Ghalil, uh, from the Arabian Gulf University, who's, uh, I th believe, to be speaking on, uh, from the point of view of the Arab uh, Forum for Environmental Development. Um, I hope that's uh, correct. Um, and then uh, the utility angle will be covered by Abdullah, Abdullah al Suwaidi, um, who's the Executive Director of, uh, Operations Director at the Abu Dhabi Distribution Company. And finally, um, uh, another English person, uh, uh, Claire Yates, or Yeats, uh, from Waterscan, who has um, been working actually here in Abu Dhabi, uh, reducing the sort of water footprint of the airport in a clever way. Um, so I think what I'm actually going to do, because I, I feel that there's actually more life in the event if people stand up and do their presentations. So if you come here and do it from here with your little clicker, then I think the audience will feel that we're all alive, alive and awake rather than this is a, a, a bit of a morgue. So would you like to do that? Yeah, it's better. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Asad Saadi from Nestle Waters, and I will be talking about water stewardship at Nestle and our role in water resources sustainability. A few brief on Nestle's story. So um, as you might know, Nestle started almost 150 years ago. So this year, in 2016, we are celebrating the 150 years of Nestle. And during our journey, uh, Nestle acquired different uh, company. Um, you might know uh, some of them, like Nescafe, Vital, Perrier, San Pellegrino, etc. So in a, in, at a glance, Nestle employs uh, 339,000 employees in over 150 countries. We have around 442 factories in approximately 86 countries, so in most of the world, with over 2,000 brands and with 1 billion products of Nestle sold every day. Nestle Waters is part of Nestle. It's approximately representing 8% of Nestle Group sales, with uh, approximately uh, 34,000 employees, 96 factories, 35 producing countries, and approximately 52 brands of mineral water. Now, regarding the water challenge, this graph is representing the global freshwater availability versus projected demand. So as you can see on this graph, today we have 4,200 cubic kilometers of existing, accessible, reliable, and sustainable fresh water. From this 4,200 cubic kilometers globally present, we are abstracting on the global scale 4,500 cubic kilometers. 
These are the existing withdrawal globally. So which means that today already we are over exploiting the natural water resource on Earth. And with the growth of approximately 2%, it's estimated then in 2030, the global abstraction or withdrawal of groundwater will be approximately 6,900 cubic kilometers, which will represent 2,800 cubic kilometers of deficit, of global deficit. So, which means that demand versus availability gap by 2030 will be more than 40%. So, of course, you might know these figures, but these are alarming figures, and water scarcity is a new reality today. You can hear it every day on the news, in the journals. It's affecting everyone, including Nestle. Now, regarding our use of water, Nestle Waters is relatively a small global water user, so from the 4,250 cubic kilometers that are uh, cubic kilometers of water that are used, 70% are used for, in, for agriculture, 20% for industry, and around 10% for domestic use. The percentage of Nestle water use from the total amount of water is 0.003%. And the percentage of Nestle water use of water is 0.0009%. Even though we have a big responsibility in water management. So how we are dealing with water efficiency and water use in our factories. So we work to achieve sustainable and water efficiency use across all our operation. So this graph will represent our global production since 2004 till 2014, where you can see that our global production is still increasing. Whereas from the other side, you can see the graph of water withdrawal and water discharge is decreasing. So we are putting a lot of focus on water use efficiency. And for example, in 2014, we, we had 376 water saving projects running in our manufacturing facilities, in our factories. So we are putting a lot of focus in good water resource management, in water saving, to be able to keep on increasing our production and reducing the, the water. Uh, this is an example of what we call zero water factory. So it's a short video. I'll let you see the video. Edificio Cero Agua. Recibimos nosotros la leche en pipa, viene de los ranchos, nos llega la leche líquida, la condensamos, la pulverizamos. El agua que le extraemos a la leche en el proceso de evaporado, en este edificio lo tratamos para el agua hacerla potable y volverla a consumir. Mi nombre es Carlos Hernández Gutiérrez y soy responsable de la operación y mantenimiento de servicios industriales en fábrica Lagos Lácteos. La región de Lagos de Moruno, Jalisco, es una región muy árida. El agua cada vez va más en escasez. El consumo de agua de la fábrica equivale más o menos al volumen que contiene una alberca olímpica. Traemos la leche del rancho, viene de la vaca. La fábrica recibe en promedio 1.400.000 litros de leche al día. La leche se calienta, sacamos dos productos que es el agua de vaca y la leche condensada. Y esa agua de vaca que anteriormente se tiraba a drenaje, ahora la mandamos al edificio Cero Agua. Lo filtramos y lo purificamos y al final del proceso tenemos agua potable. Y esta agua potable la enviamos nuevamente al proceso para ser utilizada. Después de utilizarla, que se ensucia, la volvemos a tratar en procesos donde utilicemos agua de segunda calidad, como puede ser eh, riego de jardines o limpieza de patios. Todo el agua la fábrica la extraía de pozos profundos perforados a 200 metros. Ahora con cero agua va a ayudar a, a la comunidad y al pueblo, el pueblo en general en que las reservas de agua subterránea se van a mantener. Me siento muy orgulloso por todos los proyectos e iniciativas que, que hemos realizado en, en la fábrica porque estoy seguro que esa agua que estamos dejando de utilizar ahora 
la, la van a poder utilizar mis hijos y los hijos de mis hijos en, su, en un futuro. So this was an example of uh, what we call zero water factory, where we abstracted the, where we extracted the water from the milk and we use it in the factory, and this will enable us to stop using the groundwater in this kind of factory. But being very good in water use efficiency inside of our factories is not enough. Why? Because our operations are located most of the time inside water basins, and most of the time we are not alone to use the shared water resource or the groundwater. So even if you are best in class in water using inside the factory, and if outside the factory there is an overuse or overpumping, this will not solve the solution of groundwater. This is why Nestle launched what we call the water stewardship ladder. The water stewardship ladder is made of three steps where we go from the local level, which is the factory level, toward the basin level. And the three, on the three steps, we have in the first step the compliance, which is the internal regulation, Nestle internal regulation, that all the factories has to, be, has to abide. The second step of the ladder is the excellent in water resources management inside our factories, where all the factories have to be leading in water use efficiency, have to knowledge the impact of their factories, and have to have positive community relation with the, with the various stakeholders. And the top of the ladder is the collective action. And the collective action is engaging with local stakeholders outside the factory uh, to address shared water challenges at the catchment level. This is what we call the water stewardship ladder, which is our way toward sustainability. And we have different uh, examples of water stewardship projects. Uh, one of them is in Enie in Switzerland, where uh, it's called EcoBro project, where we engaged with the uh, farmers, local authorities, for the preservation and the protection of the water resources in the basin, not only in the factory. Another project we have is in uh, Vital, it's called AgriVare project, where we engaged with 11 towns and villages, 12,000 habitants, 30 farmers partner, for the, to regulate the use of pesticides and for better water resource management in the, in the uh, catchment area. Another ongoing project are in Pakistan with a partnership with WWF for water resource management in the basin. Another one um, we are um, also uh, doing is in Lebanon with a local NGO, which is our partner for a, a water resource management in, uh, in a park area for the sustainability of the water resources. So this is the different, uh, this is an example of different water stewardship projects we are engaging today. So we are a user of groundwater resources, water stewardship is our job, but we are driving improvement in-house, improving the use of water resource, but it's not enough. We need to lead engagement beyond the factory gate, covering all the basin, because at the end, water is everybody's business. Thank you. Obviously, you know, heard about Mexico and France and Switzerland and so forth. What is I and mean, what sort of facilities have you got in this region that are big water users? I mean, what kinds of things do you think that they are that you can introduce? And then the, the well, GCC region immediately, or the MENA region? Yes. Uh, beyond. Um, you mean a uh, water stewardship project in uh, in the region of uh, GCC? Yes. Uh, I don't I don't get the question. Exactly. What, I mean, what sorts of things is yep. Nestle doing in this region yep. uh, in terms of its uh, improving its stewardship? Yeah. Are there any? Um, have you got a? You got a milk factory here, or are they only? <laughs> Alcat, yeah. Almaria, the only people who crazy enough to have milk factories in this part of the world. Exactly. I understand the question. Now, uh, as you know, water stewardship is to um, improve water use of. Uh, uh, groundwater in the in the basin and as you know in the GCC uh, most of the used water is from desalination 
So uh, the, the context does not apply very much on, on desalination. The water stewardship is mainly... I, 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 think, I think that's a bit of a misnomer. I think that in Saudi Arabia, for example, yeah. they three and a half kilometers of water. Yes. Uh, I mean, the total abstraction is something like 16 cubic kilometers a year. Yes. And uh, of that, three and a half uh, cubic kilometers come from desalination, and the rest comes from renewable resources, which are two, two kilometers, and, uh, you know, like nine and a half kilometers of non-sustainable groundwater abstraction. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it is one of the most unsustainable. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I fully agree with you, but when we have the opportunity to use desalinated seawater, we, of course, encourage the use of desalinated seawater rather than uh, groundwater abstraction. So, Thank you. Um, let's see, do you want to take your seat next um, uh, person? Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Abdul Gelil um, from the uh, Arabian Gulf University. Let's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to give you some highlights of the uh, AFID report. AFID is the Arab Forum for Environment and Development. It's um, located in Beirut, and uh, it's non for no, a non-for-profit uh, organization. And every year, uh, ACID would choose a theme for an annual report. And this year's uh, annual report theme was about sustainable consumption, focusing on uh, water, energy, and food uh, in the Arab region. The report was launched in November uh, last year in, uh, in Beirut, and it's available uh, in the website of AFID. You can download it, it uh, completely in Arabic and English. Um, most or all of the, uh, of the AFID report uh, has been trying to raise public awareness on issues of uh, de sustainable development, especially, and, and resource management. And uh, this, this year's report is try to identify what, are kind, what kind of barriers exist in the region uh, to achieve sustainable consumption and production and trying to come up with uh, some sort of uh, policy interventions that government can do in order to bridge that, that, uh, these barriers. Um, to do so, we had uh, Three background papers written by, uh, by experts, uh, Arab experts, one in energy and one in uh, uh, water and one in food. And we had also undertook a public opinion survey uh, in the 22 Arab countries. We received 31,000 uh, respondents. And uh, the, uh, the Arab people identified three major issues as environmental challenges in the region. One of them is the inefficiency in, in water and energy. Uh, we all know that the, this region is the most water stressed region worldwide. The uh, fresh water per capita is uh, less than 1,000 uh, cubic meter, while the world average is more than 7,000. Uh, also, we found out that uh, water consumption in the Arab region generally uh, is correlated to GDP. So GCC countries with higher uh, per capita income has much higher per capita water consumption as well. Uh, talking about extraction of, uh, of fresh water, we, we know that the GCC especially has very high level of extraction, more than 700 uh, percent of, of the fresh water available in the region, uh, compared to about 85 percent in the total Arab region. These are the water uses in the GCC, and we can, we, we can see that agriculture is the major consuming, uh, uh, water consuming sector in the region. Uh, the pricing policies as well uh, played a major role in, in shaping the consumption pattern of, of water and the energy and food, actually. Uh, here I'm highlighting only the water part of the report, but 
The report dealt with the three resources, water, energy, and, and food. We all know that the region is heavily subsidized, uh, has a heavily subsidized water and the energy and food uh, pricing. I, I think the, the situation uh, is being changed right now, very recently. Uh, some, some highlights of the survey, the public survey. We found out that we, when we asked people what are the major cause of inefficiency in water and energy, the majority said they, they, don't say, they didn't say uh, subsidy. They said lack of awareness. So 46% uh, of the respondents say the major cause is, is not subsidy, it's, it's, uh, it's a lack of uh, public awareness. Uh, here is the public awareness uh, results from the GCC, and we can see that it's, it's not low, actually. Yani, UAE has more than 85% aware that the, uh, the water situation in the region is very critical, uh, Kuwait as well. So more than 50% of the GCC population understand quite well the scarcity situation of, of water in the region. However, when we ask them, do you use water saving devices in your home? Uh, unfortunately, we found out that, for example, Kuwait, which is the have, uh, has the highest per capita water consumption in the region, has the lowest penetration rate of water devices at home. The question here is why? Is it because the availability of this technology? Is it because of pricing? Is it because of lack of government policies? Uh, I think these questions should be uh, more uh, explored. When we ask them also about the percentage of, uh, of uh, water bill uh, related to family income, uh, we found that uh, less than 3% of the fa family income in most of the GCC countries are uh, consumed or uh, expended for, for, uh, to pay for, for water uh, resources. There was a question that uh, if you agree to or if you accept or are you willing to pay more for water and the energy related to the current very low level? They, the majority say yes to, to our surprise. So 77%, and this is the, the average across the 22 Arab countries, of course. Uh, they said yes, we agree on that, uh, provided that uh, we will have better social services from the government. Uh, the report also dealt with the issue of water, energy, and food. And uh, as we know, uh, agriculture is 83% uh, consuming more than 80% of the water resources in the region. And uh, that's why, uh, and most of the, especially in the GCC, uh, uh, Desalination capacity in the GCC is the highest worldwide. So, and desalination capacity is energy intensive. So, there is a, a very strong uh, nexus between energy and water in the region, and consequently, there is a special nexus also between water, energy, and food production, uh, given the fact that the region is importing. Uh, more than 50% of its w uh, food needs. Unfortunately, the current situation uh, on policy development regarding, uh, in regard to water, energy, and food, it's, it's a little bit fragmented. There is no coherence between these policies at the, at the uh, national level. Adding to this the threat of climate change that would affect, of course, what I mean, would worsen the scarcity of water resources. Uh, and so we need to have a, a coherence between water, energy, food, and the climate policy in the Arab uh, region. Uh, main finding related to, uh, to, uh, to water, agriculture is a major water consuming sector. We all know that. 
Cost of water is generally less than 3% of the family income in the region. Arab people are ready to pay more for water and energy. Uh, some countries need to increase public awareness on the, uh, on the issue of water and energy efficiency and a need for public, uh, co I mean public policy coherence. The report is available on uh, AFID online uh, website and you can download it. Thank you. Uh, just uh, before you sit down, you can ask a quick question. I mean, if you were sort of, uh, king of the Middle East, uh, ruler of... Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the one thing that you would do to sort of improve water I think public education. I still believe that public education should be a major uh, agent for a change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that education would be just don't waste water? Or? No, no, no. I mean, public education starting from, from, I mean, the beginning of the new generation, they need to know about sustainability in general, not just to save water and... and, and uh, and the energy, but how to live in a sustainable manner. Okay, okay. that's great. So I can sit down and we'll get the, the next uh, speaker up. Um, who's Abdullah, Abdullah Asuwaidi, who's uh, from the Abda Abu Dhabi Distribution Company, uh, which I guess is responsible for the pipe networks in the city? Paul? For the pipe networks? Yes, yes. Assalamu okay. alaikum. Not only the pipe network, but as well as the cables. Oh. Since the establishment of uh, Adwia and it is subsidiaries back in 1998, Adwia and its group of companies paid a big effort to make sure that the supply is available as long as uh, the growth continues. With its companies in the generation side, the transmission and the distribution side, investment was placed, thousands of kilometers of pipes and cables were put underground to secure the customer demand required for the growth for the country. The effort was not spared to be smart, to be efficient in the management of the assets underground need to be available to deploy the demand. Yet, with the global changes, maybe it's time to look whether those demands are really genuine and what we need to do in order to supply only the rightful demand at the other side of the, of the formula. In all type of customers, industries, commercial, as well as residential. When we look at the trend and the different categories, we have realized, yes, the demand do exist, yes, the growth is still continuous, yet we may, with some changes, somehow manage to supply the demand within the available resources and efficiently plan the uh, capital investment wisely if we have the possibility to manage the demand side. It's no more a luxury. Yes, it is a desalinated water, but at the same time, the factors of the environments plays a big role, and we need to be responsible, our generation and the future generation, to make sure the sustainability elements across every, every factors in life. The subsidies will not continue to be the, as it is. And as one of my colleagues, one of the speakers said, yes, it was lifted to a certain extent, yet it is still heavily subsidized. There are an effort to be paired. There are somehow lack of awareness at that side of how important is this precious product that we are utilizing in our days. Some of the other challenges probably somebody need to step up and play the role of a champion to highlight the importance of efficiently utilizing this product. 
maybe as well, we need to work with our co-partners, other government entities, to provide the right for regulations, the guidance, uh, not only for the customer, but as well as the market, to make it possible. There are some, somehow lack of few regulations, somehow lack of few laws that can support managing the demand side. With the existing nature of our environment, maybe the demand and the growth will continue, but yet I think we have a space to provide some management to that side. With this in mind, ADDC and ADWIA are stepping forward to play its role in this, in this, uh, in this area. We are planning, we're actually considering ourselves that we are responsible and we should somehow play the advisory role to that sector, to that part, and provide the rightful guidance for our consumers to make them aware of how important this product that is available right now and how important it is to efficiently utilize it in a proper way according to the efficient demand that we desire. We have that vision and we have illustrated a mission for our company to go forward and participate to manage the demand side. We have prepared a strategy to go forward, a five-step strategy which has started already. Within the next six months, we will have, we will have a set of initiatives, a set of uh, projects that we need to put forward in order to achieve the goals that we have put in place for that side. We need we need to identify the major area in which if we provide the rightful tools, we can achieve the maximum saving. And with this strategy in place, which will go even beyond 2018, we expect to have somehow achieved the right saving on the demand. The strategy will address the importance to make our customer aware of how to utilize this product and how to be more efficient in providing it. Not only on this side, but even in the market side, as, well, as far as the quality of the product available in the market and what are the different tools and technology needed to be available in order to achieve the efficiency required. It will focus on a number of elements, as well as there are a number of initiatives. The strategy analysis has already started. How best to reduce the consumption of those resources and even to prioritize of the potential DSM measures to achieve an early success have already launched, and our consultants, as well as our DSM team, are doing the effort to identify which area to target first. There are set programs. There is a dedicated structure that are going to be put in place because of the importance of that. More engagement of our stakeholders, the consumer side, the regulatory side, and even uh, the government, the other part of the governments. We need to identify what are the, the dependencies, link them together, and identify the roles of each. And what are the possible applications of DSM within ADDC operation structure program that can be placed forward. Some of the initiatives, but not limited to those. Uh, whatever techniques that we can identify in the market, and whatever techniques that we can even develop inside, in-house, uh, the processes, the mechanism of uh, uh, the internal distribution, the involvement, as we said, with, with our different stakeholders in order to utilize some of the used water within the house itself. There are several, several number of initiatives to make use of the wasted water, let me say. 
and pro try to provide the, the different mechanism and regulation in order to utilize whatever possible from the used water in order to only supply the, de the actual demand of uh, potable water for, for the use of human being. Uh, we will try to focus in the awareness side of this, of this, of, uh, as part of our strategy. Awareness of our client and customers toward that important part of our uh, strategy on the demand side management. Within the 2030, we hope to achieve a 20% reduction on the demand side. How we will achieve that, we will try to push forward a lot of public awareness programs, benchmark the baselines, we, we hope also to achieve, as part of that, savings on the, on the production side. A lot of environmental uh, uh, goals will be achieved by maintaining the supply, supply side as a, at the same time efficiently supply the demand side. As our customer is the very important and the major player we're planning to introduce programs, trying to also support them by providing quality products, by helping the markets through the proper regulation and proper standards to provide the products that will help achieving an efficient utilization of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of this product. Initiative like technology, Repaid programs are well under study right now in order to identify what will be the best way forward for our customer. Educational program, as stated already by Dr. Ibrahim, is part of the strategy. And with our stakeholders, like the Education Council, we will also introduce programs to publicize the importance of the product and how important that people go and adopt the demand side, the different demand side programs that Abu Dhabi Distribution Company is going forward with. Generally, the demand side is simply interconnected and flexible programs that need to be put together from the different uh, side of it. The consumer has one part, the market has another part, and we as, as operator are the different part. So it's a simply flexible programs that we need to put together to allow our consumer for a greater role in reducing their overall consumption. ADDC, in general, have put a statement forward that we still need to meet the demand, uh, the demanded growth, yet enhancing the efficiency is part of our focus. Thank you. I'm just going to ask you about um, the relative importance of removing the subsidies. I mean, it seems to me that nobody's going to really invest in um, you know, water saving equipment and so forth unless there is a real benefit and you know unless you know, I mean my guess is that um, there are several African countries where the water tariffs are still lower than the tariffs for UAE citizens in Abu Dhabi um, you know you could probably you know double the tariffs quite happily and still be cheaper than say Kampala or uh, uh, Dhaka See, every, every step or a decision we need to make has to be considered or studied not only as far as the money-wise uh, is concerned, but as well as the other factors, the elements of uh, the environmental impact, the elements of uh, uh, the future generation. Mainly, we depend on, on uh, uh, desalinated water. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the risks behind that? So we... When we look at this subs subsidy, the government has already played that role since long, since the start, actually. What has been decided recently is a simple reduction in that subsidy, yet it's not to cover the full cost. Lifting the subsidy have been identified through different organizations that it is one of the major players in really achieving sort of awareness through the customer 
to make them aware of how important the product in hand and try to utilize it efficiently. Are we expecting more lift of the subsidy? Possibility do exist. Whether that's going to affect the market or the supply side, again, possibility do exist. But we still need to move forward and do some of those measures. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, finally, Claire, do you want to come up? And, and this is, Claire's got her, uh, her business is essentially about uh, encouraging customers to adopt measures which save water and ideally save money. And so I think she's going to tell us about something that she's uh, been up to in Abu Dhabi uh, uh, Airport. I am indeed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Christoph said, uh, WaterScan uh, delivers water management services and has done so commercially to businesses for over 21 years. Um, we range from writing strategic plans to water stewardship to the implementation of water efficient projects and design, supply and installation of water recycling systems. So in the UK, we don't really suffer from water scarcity. Um, our greatest challenge that's water related is in fact flooding, um, creating major damage to businesses and homes alike. Um, so the concept and actually the World Economic Forum that was referred to earlier, the report that highlighted that demand is going to outstrip supply considerably by 2030 was a risk that many businesses could understand and therefore started to consider and water became much more of a priority for our clients worldwide. So the case study I'm going to present on today is on grey water. So I've just put a brief definition up here for you today. We design two different types of systems. One is a chemical free low energy solution, um, which can deliver up to 20 cubic meters of water a day. And for a larger system, we have an on demand, which has a small element of chemical dosing. The project that I'm going to talk to you about is at Abu Dhabi International Airport, and it was instigated by Whitbread. Whitbread have been a client of ours for almost 10 years, and you'll know them for Premier Inn. You'll also be familiar with their brand Costa Coffee. They have 670 UK hotels and a, a similar number of pub restaurants as well operating in the UK. They are building one hotel a week in the UK over the coming years and they're developing internationally, uh, the first installation being here in Abu Dhabi, and they're also developing quite significantly in Europe. As a business, um, Whitbread are at the forefront of sustainability in the UK. They developed a Good Together program, which puts sustainability at the core of everything that they do. People within their business are incentivized to reduce carbon, to reduce energy, to reduce water, and this is reflected throughout every operation that they implement. So, as a whole, for what we do for Whitbread, we have looked at low bathroom solutions, we look at customer and employee engagement, monitoring and managing so that they can see exactly how water is used at their sites. We also do rainwater harvesting on their pubs. Um, but grey water was an absolute no-brainer for these guys because when we looked how water was used within the hotels, we found that there was a significant match between the yield from the showers and the toilet flushing that was happening within the sites. Now this pie chart clearly shows that, however, with the efficiency that we've introduced within the toilet flushing, now the yield exceeds the demand and so we can meet all of their flushing requirements. So we worked with them to develop a system that gave them excellent water quality, gave them security of supply and was easy for them to maintain. I don't need to talk about this slide really, you all know why it would be implemented here. Um, but it is interesting if you haven't visited the Abu Dhabi Environment Agency stand to see that actually recycling water is a key focus to reduce the amount of desalination that's being undertaken. So the design's absolutely critical um, to ensure that we have enough water to meet the demand in the evening. So we collect the water um, quite simply in, in, a, in a tank and it then goes through a significant slow process over a 12 hour period. 
So we start with aeration, and that creates a scum to get rid of any of the soap or things within the water. And that's overflowed out of the first tank so that we have no issues with the quality there. Then uh, we use a vacuum to draw the water through um, submerged membranes. And that enables it to be low energy. It's very, very long contact time, so the quality of the water at the other end is exceptionally good. And because it's at such low pressure, then the life of the filters is also between five to seven years. The treated water quality meets all of the guidelines that we need for our developments in the UK, for in the EU, and also for here in Abu Dhabi. The airport um, has 300 rooms, as you can see from this slide here, and it has the capacity to deliver 20 cubic meters a day. Um, now, they have telemetry on the system so that we in the UK can see as soon as there's any problem on the system and we can arrange for that to be uh, rectified. We can also see how the filters are working and check that they're at maximum operational efficiency and we can demonstrate the return on investment to the business. Now, we have this come into a portal and then they, you'll see a visual on the last slide. They have a nice picture showing them how much grey water they've saved versus mains water use at the site. So entering new markets, we obviously have to follow new regulations. So the design went through quite a rigorous process. There was months of conversations and negotiations and meetings with the RSB because the licensing process is actually built for municipal wastewater treatment. Um, and so it's extremely rigorous, um, much more so than we've seen in any other market, which is a good thing, obviously, for the end user. Um, it meant that we had to do lots of preparation before the build could commence. And then there was rigorous testing for six to eight weeks after the hotel, uh, the system had been installed and the hotel was operational um, to ensure that it continues to meet those standards. But it is now um, accepted and an approved technology and is delivering excellent savings for the client and obviously protecting the resource here in, the, in Abu Dhabi. And that's me. Uh, I went quickly to bring us yeah, back to time. Well. <laughs> well. I was just thinking, um, what was the payback period for the car? Uh, it varies, obviously, from region to region. But oh, so for here, it was just it will be just over four years. It's only been operational for three, oh, so right. we've got a year to go. But we're on track for oh, delivery. Okay, okay. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. much quicker. Okay. Um, I'm just looking. Uh, so you can sit down. Thank you. Um, we haven't got any. Uh, sorry. Uh, just a, a, a remark on the fact that uh, uh, high quality lifestyle and being water efficient is a conflicting dilemma in the UAE. Uh, to some extent, I don't think that that necessarily needs an answer. But I think that uh, and, unless anyone's got anything burning to say, and they can't say it in the coffee break to whoever, uh, let's uh, thank our panel and move on to the, uh, uh, because I, th I think we're supposed to end at four, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a very informative uh, session.